Cool. Uh, thank you very much, Zach. Um, and thank you for the honour. Uh, I just wanted to uh, take some time to acknowledge uh, the contributions and the awesome work that uh, my supervisors do, um, not just because two-thirds of them are in the room, but uh, uh, the associate professors uh, Daniel Johnson, um, Peter Wyeth, and Alethea Blackler, who's back in Australia right now. Um, so I'm going to start with a short biblical story. Uh, so in the beginning, there was a player, there was a video game, and there was a controller. And together, the player experience was born. Over time, many different control devices emerged, but generally, they were still just controllers. That is... They use the same control interface paradigm of one or more directional input to direct movement on screen and a series of physical buttons arbitrarily assigned to digital control actions. Eventually, new control devices emerged that use different interface paradigms, uh, interact with the virtual objects as you would in real life using a naturally mapped control device. So these employed more naturally mapped control interfaces or NMCIs. Since then, uh, many have wondered which population of players prefer to use uh, and, and get the most out of different naturally mapped control interface types. Um, are these devices really more intuitive? And then speaking of, what do we mean when we say intuitive? Um, how do different types of naturally mapped control interfaces modify the player experience? And speaking of, what are the different types? And also, uh, how does this vary across game genres? Um, so I'll look to uh, at some of the initial answers to some of these questions uh, that are drawing from my paper. Um, so starting um, with what types there are, thankfully uh, Skalski and colleagues presented in 2011 uh, their uh, typology for naturally mapped control interfaces. This exists on a continuum of natural mapping from the least on the left to the most naturally mapped control interfaces on the right. Um, they admit it's incomplete, um, so you could imagine to the left uh, less naturally mapped stuff like arbitrarily assigned um, controls or perhaps to the right more naturally mapped control interfaces, uh, perhaps using virtual or augmented reality. But the types as they exist, uh, there's uh, directional, where the direction of the input is mapped. Um, so you press forward on a control stick, you move forward. You press left, you move, move left. Um, there's kinesic, where kind of loose and general body uh, motions are translated into the uh, virtual actions, um, usually using some sort of camera device. There's incomplete tangible. Um, where you have a tangible object to hold on to and you manipulate that like you would the real life object that it's being rep represented by in the game. Um, however, it doesn't necessarily look or feel like that. And then realistic tangible where it also looks and feels like that, um, the, the real life version of the virtual object being um, represented. Um, uh, so it's important to note that these types apply to specific instances of game and interface pairs. Um, so you can generalize about the, the types that a control device supports, um, but to actually say this is that type, you need to look at you know, how it's being mapped to a particular game. Um, and uh, Skalski and colleagues had uh, hypothesized effects that more naturally mapped control interfaces would lead to um, higher levels of perceived naturalness, uh, higher levels of spatial presence, and more enjoyment. They confirmed um, the first two. They were un unable to confirm the last one. Um, however, there's other work in this field where, that has shown that uh, more naturally mapped um, control interfaces lead to higher levels of enjoyment. Um, yeah. So, um, another one of the questions is how do we define intuitive interactions? So, we use this term a lot, I think, in our field and in, um, in the industry and in the media. Um, we talk about things being intuitive. Certainly, hardware manufacturers claim things are intuitive without fully ever explaining what, what that means. Um, so, we refer to a field of research, intuitive interaction, which has been uh, emerging over the last decade. Um, and they basically set out to define uh, what intuitive interaction is and, and what goes into that and, and uh, develop understanding of that. Um, so they say that it's based on previous experience that an, uh, an interface isn't intuitive in and of itself. 
However, the information processing that can be applied to it uh, can be. So basically, um, we come across all sorts of interfaces and devices in our lives, uh, different objects, uh, different mechanisms, and uh, we, uh, the more we interact with them, the more familiar we become with them, uh, the more they kind of build up in our subconscious. And then we have those when we're presented with a new interface, we can subconsciously draw on that amalgamated pool of knowledge and apply intuitive interaction with that interface. Um, uh, it is uh, being defined as largely subconsciously derived, so little cognitive effort um, is being applied and therefore its intuitive use is very fast uh, by definition as well. Um, there's uh, some continuum that the, the intuitive interaction researchers have um, built and basically the top continuum is saying that you enable broader potential for intuitive interaction by designing around knowledge that is more pervasive in society um, because it has higher levels of encoding and retrieval so that is we use and we access that knowledge more often. So understanding the weight of objects, the direction, motion, impact, the way things move in the world, um, these things exist at the sensory motor level and are across all societies. So if we design um, for that, then our products have a higher chance of intuitive interaction being applied to them. However, if we use expertise knowledge, um, like needing to know the correct syntax for a programming language or understanding how to operate flight controls, then intuitive interaction is still possible, but you're aiming at a much smaller target. Basically, the bottom continuum um, is saying the less conceptual distance between the product and how we would understand how to interact with it by looking at it or knowing what class of product it is, the higher the potential for intuitive interaction. So again, if the shape or the mechanics of an interface inform us how to hold and interact with it, then that's great. It's got a huge potential for intuitive interaction. If we have to employ a metaphor or borrow interaction styles from other domains or similar domains um, entirely, then perhaps we're introducing some cognitive processing there um, for some users that are not familiar with those domains and so the, the potential for intuitive interaction is lessened. Um, so in measuring intuitive interaction, um, Blackler developed the technology familiarity questionnaire to predict the potential for intuitive interaction that captures previous experience um, with, with the studied product or interface and similar products or interfaces. It looks at um, capturing the frequency of use and the number of features used and then it tallies that into a score for each participant. Um, uh, greater, with greater frequency and breadth of use receiving um, a higher score. And that's been shown to be an accurate predictor for intuitive use um, in, uh, with products with functional interfaces like microwaves and remote controls and digital cameras. So we designed a racing game experiment. Um, had 64 participants. Uh, it lasted for approximately an hour and it was repeated measures. So all participants used the three controllers that we um, had them use in the game. It was uh, using Forza Motorsport Forza Motorsport 4 um, on Xbox 360. And these are the control devices that um, we used to represent the different types of naturally mapped control interfaces. Um, so the controller, because the steering is, uh, you know, you press left on the control stick, it goes left, you press right on the control stick, it goes right, so that's directional mapping. The speed wheel is incomplete tangible um, because you interact with it like you would um, the, the real life interface, but it doesn't really look anything like that. Um, and the racing wheel, uh, because it also has that look and feel, it's uh, leather bound, spring loaded, um, etc. Um, in terms of the procedure, so the GTF and other char character, um, sorry, the game technology familiarity questionnaire, I should say, and other um, demographic information was captured at the start. They'd play the uh, game with one of the control devices um, for four minutes, um, and that was counterbalanced by their age group. Um, we captured the player response. We administered uh, perceived naturalness player experience surveys, including GEQ and PENS um, and interviews, and then we'd repeat those steps um, for the following, uh, for, the, for the other two control devices. Um, so I'll just talk briefly about the game technology familiarity questionnaire and measure. Um, so basically it's aimed at quantifying relevant previous experience, both to predict the potential for intuitive use, which we thought was important in this space, um, and also uh, to determine how previous experience uh, influences or impacts on other play experience, um, player experience factors. So it's a component-based approach using items that measure uh, participant exposure to the actual interface, uh, interface elements game and activity, activity being tested, and also similar interfaces, um, interface elements, games and activities. And it's presented as a guided survey um, to participants 
And basically, we had some participants that had never played games before in their life, um, and so they're quite technical features that we're asking about, so we wanted to be able to kind of guide them through and, and make sure we got some accurate responses there. Five scores, GTF scores, were calculated um, for each participant. One uh, relevant to intuitive use with each of the control devices. Um, one relevant to intuitive use with the game. Um, so the items for that were, uh, if you've ever played or used the Forza Motorsport um, series, um, or similar 3D racing games, and one for race life GTF, so that was if you've ever drove or raced a motorized wheel control vehicle in real life, so to capture stuff like go-karts and trucks and cars and all that kind of stuff. Um, these are the 13 items um, that were for the GTF um, survey, um, and you can't see those, so let's take a closer look at uh, the top left. Um, so basically for the directional GTF, that's um, items relevant to the controller, the actual controller um, was measured um, exposure to that, uh, exposure to analog th thumbstick on any other controller, so which basically almost says any other kind of modern controller. Um, analog triggers, um, because that's what steering, I'm sorry, that's what accelerating and braking were assigned to, um, and a circle pad or analog nub on a handheld video game console. So you're also looking at similar features from similar types of devices as well. Um, and three questions were asked for each item. Um, so the, there was two to establish the temporal exposure and recency of use, um, and that was when was the initial and most recent time the item was used, played or done. Response options ranged from never to in the last few days, and there was one to establish the frequency of exposure, and that was at the time when the item was being used, played or done the most approximately how often was this. And responses for that range from daily to less often than every few months. Um, and then responses were scored by their relative temporal differences. Um, so I won't get into detail with that uh, today, um, but uh, there is more information on that in the supplementary materials for the paper, um, which I think we're working on getting up to the, um, the ACM digital database, but in the meantime you can email me if you wanted to get a copy of those. Um, so a little detail on the formula, basically what we were trying to factor or take into account was the temporal length of use of exposure, the recency of use or exposure to those items, and also the frequency of use or exposure. And then we weighted those, the scores for those items um, for the relevant uh, overall game technology familiarity scores, scores for each participant. So um, in terms of measuring intuitive uses then, we used the three-item intuitive controls construct from the pens. Thank you. Um, uh, so that was used as a perceived measure of intuitive interaction. And then we used two measures to um, objectively assess the intuitive controls of each interface as well. So performance, which was basically progress uh, towards the in-game goals, um, the percentage complete at four minutes. And then errors, uh, uh, which was basically uh, uh, mistakes in judgment, um, the car spinning around, flipping over onto its side, uh, etc. And that was codified post-play um, using uh, screen footage captured. So just briefly take a look at some results. Um, so here we see device GTF percentage in the top left um, broken down by age and then progress um, broken down by the same groups in the bottom right. So participants broadly had less familiarity with the more naturally mapped devices. Um, younger participants had more familiarity with the devices than older participants. And the younger participants also had a bigger difference between their familiarity, le familiarity levels between devices. Um, however, when we look at um, both compared, we see that nearly all the same differences between groups existed um, between the GTF and um, progress, uh, um, one of our objective measures of, of intuitive controls. So I guess showing GTF appears to, to be a good predictor of performance or intuitive controls in that case. In the case of our other um, intuitive interaction measures, uh, the oldest participants had more errors um, with the controller. Females reported the controls, controls as having less perceived intuitive controls. Um, and, and so older and female participants had less familiarity across devices um, so, so this kind of suggests that higher levels of natural mapping in the control device may indeed provide a greater potential for intuitive interaction uh, for those with low domain familiarity. So for those with high domain familiarity, they weren't seeing the same benefits, um, but there wasn't really a detriment for using them either. Um, there was just, there was no difference. 
Um, finally, I just wanted to point out as well the, the race life familiarity um, level uh, measure. So this was uh, the level to which you're exposed to the real life equivalent activity, driving and racing in real life. Um, did show a difference with um, perceived intuitive control such that, such that the uh, high race life familiarity group um, uh, had a higher level of perceived sorry, intuitive controls for the more naturally mapped devices, so for the speed wheel and racing wheel, um, yet there was no difference for the other devices. So what this suggests um, is that uh, there's a multimodal approach, so the kind of subjective and objective measurement of um, intuitive interaction uh, appears to be beneficial, especially in the early stages of uh, intuitive interaction research in games. Um, also, uh, this kind of component-based approach to measuring previous experience um, uh, appears to be useful as well um, and an accurate predictor of intuitive use. Um, and finally, naturally mapped control interfaces um, that use a higher level of natural mapping may provide a greater potential for intuitive use as um, some claim, but not necessarily for everyone. Um, so specifically for those with low domain familiarity um, and, and perhaps high familiarity with the domain that's, that's being mapped from the real life activity as well. Um, in terms of future work, um, we'll be applying a similar study design to a tennis game, introducing new naturally mapped control interface types. Um, so we'll look at Kinesic. Um, with, well, there's obviously been, been a lot of work done um, with Kinect and, and camera-based um, devices, um, but there's, there's little space for this kind of comparison because there's not many games that support um, all of these devices in the same mode. Um, we're also interested to see whether um, a shell on a control device uh, is really realistic tangible um, and if that provides the same kind of differences um, versus something that has kind of more tangibility and is more lifelike. Um, refining the GTF um, and applying that again and also uh, looking at broader player, player experience impacts. So this is a bit of a long shot but if you happen to be in the Brisbane area in Australia in the next uh, couple of months or know people there, feel free to send them my way. So thank you.